Thank you. All right. So good morning and thank you for joining us for Winship Grand Rounds. If you're an Emory University or healthcare employee and would like to receive CME credit for attending today, the login information is 261176 and can be found in the chat feature at the bottom of your screen for our virtual attendees. Event, if you have any issues with this webinar or the CME login, please send Margaret Johns an email or drop a note in the chat feature. This morning, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Nicole Nikki Schmidt. Dr. Schmidt received her MD from Washington University in St. Louis and completed her residency at uh, similarly named University of Washington in Seattle and a fellowship in head and neck surgery and tumor biology at the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Schmidt uh, served as the faculty uh, on the faculty at Johns Hopkins and the NIH before joining Emory in 2020 at the height of COVID. So she is an associate professor in the Department of uh, ENT Otolaryngology at the Emory University School of Medicine. She also serves as co-director for the Head and Neck Translational Research Program. A board certified otolaryngologist, Dr. Schmidt specializes in the treatment of head and neck cancer. Dr. Schmidt is a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, American Academy of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, and American Head and Neck Society. At Winship, Dr. Schmidt is a member of the Discovery and Developmental Research Program. Her research interest is in characterizing immune effects of novel therapeutic combinations per head and neck cancer. And I'll say that's a, that's a pretty long list of accomplishments. Dr. Schmidt uh, hails originally from Las Vegas, and although I've never played poker with her, I'm sure she's exceptional at that as she is in everything else. And I'll just say on a personal level, uh, Nikki really is, an, Dr. Schmidt is an amazing uh, doctor, scientist, parent to two adorable boys and friend. And so it's really my absolute pleasure to welcome her today for a talk entitled Repurposing Statin Drugs for Head and Neck Cancer. Take it away, Dr. Schmidt. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Buckwell, for the warm welcome. And I'm mm -hmm. um, delighted to be here talking about uh, some work that we've been doing that we started at NIH and that we've um, um, deliberately brought to Emory. So thank you very much for that. Um, these are my disclosures that are not directly related to this talk. And so just kind of bring everybody back to remind you what statin drugs are from your pharmacology classes eons ago. Um, statin drugs are basically HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. Uh, they're used for hyperlipidemia, and they're one of the most commonly prescribed classes of drugs worldwide. Um, so you, if you remember how these work, basically, you see the what is called the mevalonate pathway, essentially acetyl-CoA getting turned into uh, mevalonate, and then that gets turned into cholesterol and other metabolites. And uh, one of the enzymes that is in this pathway that is critical is HMG-CoA um, reductase, and that's exactly what statins inhibit. So when this happens, it, it inhibits the cell's ability to synthesize cholesterol. And as a result of that, there's a feedback loop wherein the LDL receptor goes up on the cell surface. Essentially, if the cell can't make cholesterol, it has to take in more cholesterol by ramping up the LDL receptor expression. And when it does that, it pulls more cholesterol out of the serum into the cells and the serum cholesterol drops, which is the goal. Uh, for these drugs, and they have had uh, a tremendous impact on um, cardiovascular disease over the last um, several decades, actually since 1987, when lowestatin was first FDA approved. Uh, as you may know, they have a lot of pleiotropic or off-target effects, which some of which are, are quite beneficial, including anti-inflammatory, neuroprotective, and immune-enhancing effects, which is um, our latest interest. And if you look at our head and neck cancer patients who often um, have smoking habits and other, um, other issues, about half of them should be on statins, uh, but the largest incidence we've seen of patients actually taking them is 40%. And that was in you know Bethesda, which is sort of an affluent suburb of Washington, D.C. And our numbers here are, are quite a bit lower in Georgia. Um, so I started taking an interest several years ago in repurposing statins for head and neck cancer patients. And my initial interest was related to survivorship. In other words, how do we use statins to limit the side effects of diff different treatments. And initially, I was interested in how they could be used to prevent cisplatinototoxicity, in other words, hearing loss caused by chemotherapy. And then I, I due to a couple of uh, radiation oncology colleagues, I learned that these can also be used to prevent radiation fibrosis in our patients and also potentially radiation-induced stroke. 
so that was really where we started off, uh, just again, looking at all these different survivorship issues, thinking that patients taking these uh, drugs would be better off if they survived their cancer. And then ultimately became interested in survival itself uh, based on some data to suggest that there is superior survival in patients taking statins at the time of diagnosis that we don't fully understand. And I believe that it's due to enhanced responses to, um, to immunotherapy and enhancing the, the innate um, uh, underlying immune response in a given patient. So we'll talk about all of those. Important to note that this is team science. Um, so this is just, you know, a selection of the uh, incredible individuals with whom I've had the pleasure of collaborating on some of these, these topics. So I'm going to start by talking about hearing loss. Uh, so when I was at NIH, I was actually not at NCI. I was at the National Institute for Deafness and Other Communication Disorders, where, you know, otolaryngologists were collaborating on a variety of things from hearing loss most prominently, but also um, head and neck cancer in, in the intramural world. And um, initially, I started doing research as a resident, thinking I was going to be a neurotologist specializing in ears. And I got interested in how different drugs, particularly cisplatin chemotherapy, causes hearing loss. And you know, and then I sort of I like to say that I saw the light and I gravitated towards the cancer patients, and I felt like they, I had a stronger connection with them. But I always kind of kept one toe in the water with cisplatin ototoxicity because my patients are actually getting this drug. And they're getting the hearing loss, and, and they're um, dramatically affected by this in their survivorship. So while I was at NIDCD, I uh, linked up with uh, two wonderful collaborators, Lisa Cunningham, who's now the scientific director of the Institute, and Kate Fernandez, who's an um, amazing um, staff scientist there. And their interest was to see whether statins could prevent hearing loss. They actually had some data to suggest that uh, heat shock proteins can reduce cisplatin-induced hearing loss. And known that statins are known inducers of HSP32. And this was an idea that was just kind of one line in her graduate student's thesis that kind of made a light bulb go on. Um, and then interestingly, statins are known to reduce hearing losses from a variety of other insults like aminoglycoside antibiotics or noise um, or aging in animal models. And so they, they tried this in a mouse model and they found that lovastatin was able to reduce this cisplatin induced hearing loss. At the same time, I was sort of starting my clinical practice and really frustrated with this problem of cisplatin-induced hearing loss. And we didn't even have good epidemiologic data on how common it was, when it stabilizes, when a patient should get a hearing aid or when they should hold off. And so the, the three of us really decided to team up and, and try to tackle this problem together. So, you know, we decided, you know, this should be easy, right? Let's go back and find a bunch of patients who have had head and neck cancer, been treated with cisplatin or any cancer, treated with cisplatin chemotherapy, and let's um, let's find their audiograms, let's find their hearing tests, and see if they were taking statins and whether it made a difference. It's actually not that simple because nobody is doing hearing tests on adults. For a, for a child getting cisplatin chemotherapy, it's very common to do a hearing test before and after because children are most vulnerable and it, it has a big impact on their speech development and other things, but in adults, you know, we're often scrambling to get patients into treatment, and um, most uh, oncologists even otolaryngologists don't order a hearing test on a patient before they em embark on their treatment. So we did actually find two centers. One of them um, in our backyard at the time was Walter Reed National Military Medical Center that had an ototoxicity monitoring program. And University of Rochester, who is an, uh, their, whose chair is, like me, uh, a head and neck surgeon interested in ear research. <laughs> and so we linked up with them and collected some retrospective data. And at the same time, we opened a small sort of pilot uh, observational prospective study at Johns Hopkins and NIH, where any patients treated with chemo radiation at Johns Hopkins were enrolled for a pre-treatment and post-treatment hearing test, and we recorded whether they were taking statins. And the prospective didn't yield much, only 28 patients, but altogether we got about 277 patients on whom we had good high-quality hearing data. And this is what we found. So this graph shows you a threshold shift. In other words, what is the threshold that's required to hear a certain pitch at a certain frequency before treatment and after treatment? And so the, the bigger the magnitude of the threshold shift, the more hearing loss. And so splatin chemotherapy, along with most other ototoxic drugs, causes hearing loss in the higher frequencies. So um, I end up defending a lot of husbands who, um, whose wives are frustrated because female voices are the first things to sort of drop out when they ha this happens. And, I, and there's a lot, of, a lot of squabbling in the office. Um, and so you can see that with no statins, their high frequency hearing loss was, um, was, was notable. 15 decibels on a log scale is, is clinically notable. But with any statin that was reduced um, almost below what's clinically relevant, 
And then interestingly, we look, started looking at individual statins. Our most common one that we patients were using is a torvastatin, also known as Lipitor, and you've seen the commercials. And then in, in stark contrast to that, cyphostatin, it appears to provide no protection. Um, and when we look back at some of the other drugs that are less commonly used, some of the others, rosuvastatin and pravastatin, are also appear to be protective, but we didn't have enough data to power those analyses. So it's very interesting. That what we learned from this is that not all statins are created equal. And not only are the pleiotropic effects mysterious, but they're not all the same. So that just makes things a little bit more compli complicated, a little co complex. So we look at this by uh, CTCAE criteria, which most of us as oncologists are more familiar with. This is um, what we use in clinical trials to grade toxicities. And so if we looked at how many patients had at least a grade one hearing loss, which is something that they noticed. And it's, it's really half, which is kind of staggering. Again, we started out not having good epidemiologic data on this. We tried to write a review paper back in 2017, and the rates of hearing loss in the different studies ranged from 13 to 88%, which is not useful information. But this is modern IMRT and cisplatin chemotherapy. And what we, we learned is approximately half of our patients have hearing loss. It's a major problem that was reduced to about 40% or less with all statins and with atorvastatin, it was reduced even further. And when we look at the severity, what's interesting is it's not the grade one hearing loss that reduced, it's the grade two and three hearing loss that is really debilitating that gets reduced. I mean, these are the kind of patients where, you know, grade two and three hearing loss, you're in a restaurant and you can't hear the waiter telling you what the special is with all the background noise. It's really a big deal. And so this was, was exciting for us. Um, it, we also, at the same time, uh, were starting to think about how we look at that prospectively. And um, at, right around the time I came to Emory, in part, so that we could look at it prospectively in a bigger uh, cohort. And I met Bill Stokes, who's a radiation oncologist here at, um, uh, at Emory in Winship. And he um, introduced me to this study, which is a phase two study called the Pravacure trial, where statins were used to not only reduce, but literally reverse radiation fibrosis. So in this study, they actually identified patients, this is done in France, they identified patients who had significant radiation fibrosis involving their neck skin um, that was somewhat debilitating, and then a year after treatment put them on pravastatin, and you can see the waterfall plot and also the, uh, the incidence of fibrosis, the fibrosis density measured by high-frequency ultrasound was dramatically reduced after pravastatin, which is fascinating to me. Again, it's another statin, and what, why did they choose pravastatin versus others? Hard to say, but it seems to work. And um, what about stroke? So an, another um, topic I learned of interest right around when I was, you know, getting these data that we that we published on hearing, I ran into Jennifer Dorth, who's another radiation oncologist at Case Western. And Jen, for years, has been trying to get a trial going through ECOG Akron to use statins to prevent stroke um, radiation to the neck involves the carotid artery, patients develop significant plaques and they're at risk for increased uh, incidence of stroke. And so in our nasopharyngeal cancer survivors, this is a, a kind of a big deal at 15 years, it's 14% versus 3% in the general population in the same time frame. And for mysterious reasons, our patients with HPV positive uh, head and neck cancer appear to be more at risk for this. You can see that um, sorry, somewhat blurry, sorry, a graph on the right where the hazard ratio for HPV positive patients was 4.4. Uh, and why that is, we, we don't fully understand. But these are our patients who, you know, come in and get diagnosed at age 50, and then, you know, they, they live long enough to have multiple complications, and, and stroke apparently is one of them in a subset of those, of those patients. And so, um, Jen has found in the literature is that things that predict the radiation-related vascular injury include LDL levels and statin use, not surprisingly. So, and looking at carotid intima media thickness, which is a surrogate measure for uh, stroke risk, you actually measure this by high frequency ultrasound. Um, the lower the patient's LDL cholesterol, the lower that, that numeric value. And then looking at, again, the composite uh, risk of ischemic stroke or TIA in statin users versus non statin users with head and neck cancer, um, statin users appear to have, to have significant protection with a hazard ratio of 0.4. So, um, you know, we started thinking about this, you know, connected with Jen and uh, my colleagues at IDCD and with Bill here, and we were trying for years to get a study going at ECOG Akron or another cooperative group to look at whether statins can pre prevent all of these things in our patients. And um, we were kind of plagued by a couple of ethical concerns that came up. Number one, 
is it ethical to randomize patients to placebo or no statin when 50% of our patients should be on them? And this is the, the pushback that um, Jen Doris has been getting for years because she keeps pitching this trial to the cardiotoxicity committee at ECOG Akron. And all the cardiologists want to put everybody on statins. <laughs> they don't understand that when somebody comes into my office, I'm not putting them on statins. I'm getting them, you know, set up with a radiation oncologist. We're getting them in with medical oncology. We're getting their cisplatin. And we're not making time to get them to see the cardiologist and get a hearing test before doing this. I wish we were, but we're not. And so that's been something that we've been um, dealing with for years and getting, getting pushback. And the other question was, does statin therapy negatively impact survival? Um, and actually, it turns out there are data in the literature to suggest the opposite. In fact, that statins may enhance survival in headache cancer patients. So here are two big database studies. The one on the left was from senior Medicare data from my colleague Sana Karam at the University of Colorado. And actually, Bill Stokes worked on this uh, with Sana when he was a resident in Colorado. And what they found in SEER Medicare was that patients who had a diagnosis of hyperlipidemia who were on statins at diagnosis had improved survival over patients uh, who didn't have those things. And then the same thing was found in a Canadian registry, the Ontario Cancer Registry as well. And so th this was fascinating to me. And I started to think, you know, I'm, a, I'm interested in survivorship, but I'm also interested in survival of my patients. So I started getting interested in how this is happening. What is the mechanism? We don't know. Um, although it's known, and there are uh, many studies in the literature that shows that statins can actually um, kill cancer cells, and cancer cells are particularly reliant on some of those metabolites in the mevalonic pathway that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. But maybe there's something more going on, and started coming across while looking for evidence to put in our grants that make a good argument that this is not going to impact survival in a patient treated with cisplatin, coming across numerous articles suggesting that manipulation of cholesterol can actually enhance the anti-tumor immune response. And one of those articles was by uh, Paolo Acierto's group in Italy, where they basically looked at what patients are taking when they're getting anti-PD-1 immunotherapy, and are any of those concomitant medications associated with a positive response or survival? Um, and they basically uh, found that statin users were more likely to respond to anti-PD-1 therapy with an odd ratio of 1.6. Now, this was not head neck cancer, this was melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer, and renal cell cancer. Um, and then they also um, looked at survival and it didn't impact survival. And we looked at this here and with Dr. Buckwald, who's they found that time of day seems to matter when you deliver the anti-PD-1 therapy. We looked at um, statins and didn't find a significant response in renal cell. Um, but, you know, so then, but we hypothesized that for whatever reason, this might be the mechanism by which statins improve survival with head and neck cancer. So we actually looked at our data set here. We went back and, and found 158 patients. Head, head and neck cancer has not been treated as long as melanoma with immunotherapy. And um, a lot of the seminal work in the trials that led to FDA approval were, were done here uh, with Nabil Saba and others here at Emory. But we had um, 158 patients we were able to identify who had had at least three doses of pembrolizumab or nivolumab. And um, we took out the ones who were on combination therapeutic trials with cabozantinib, for example, which had a, a, a nice response. And we, just, and we looked at the, uh, the percent of these patients that actually demonstrated an objective response by imaging. And with no statin, it was 17%, which is pretty typical for head and neck cancer. But with all statins, it went up to 40%. And with lowest statin in particular, it was 50% with an odds ratio of 6.6. .6, and this was significant. Um, and when we look at survival in head and neck cancer, at least, it is very close to significance. If you use the standard um, log rank or mantle Cox test, which gives equal weight to all the data points, it is approaching certain significance. But if you use a different um, statistical test that puts w heavier weight on the earlier time points, I think you can sort of appreciate that the um, um, earlier in this curve, there's a little bit of benefit you know, separation, curve separation here and here earlier in the curve. And, and by that measure, it is significant. So I didn't expect to find any significance at all with, with 158 patients. I was pleasantly surprised to see this. Um, so looking at the literature, there are lots of emerging data suggesting cholesterol is important for anti-tumor immunity. Um, some major um, high impact papers have come out uh, to suggest this. One suggesting that um, uh, statin drugs and PCSK9 inhibitors, which are used for refractory or familial hyper, hyperlipidemia, they can enhance T-cell function by reversing T-cell expression of PD-1 and other co checkpoints. Um, they increase production of IL-2, which is an important um, readout. 
They also enhance um, T cell production of other cytokines and satellite granules. They can improve MHC class one recycling and also um, and, and the bottom line is they can enhance responses to anti cd one therapy and a few different papers. So, um, so here's one of those papers just to show an example where they use a, a CT26 um, colorectal cancer model and they treat it with oxaliplatin, which is the standard chemotherapy for that disease. With or, uh, without anti-PD-1 and statin. I think they used simvastatin. And um, they, they decided to give it, for whatever reason, by IP injection at 20 mg per kg. And um, they don't really have statin and PD-1 by themselves, but you could see that versus statin and oxaliplatin um, alone, or anti-PD-1 alone, when they used the triple combination, they got a home run. And they found that this was specific to KRAS mutant uh, models. So we wanted to do this too. I said, what about head and neck cancer? But as I mentioned earlier, with the with the whole hearing thing, not all statins are created equal. And uh, we had a home run with a torvastatin for hearing, but not with simvastatin. So which one do we use and why? And so there are actually seven commercially available statin drugs, um, in addition to others that have been you know pulled from the market for whatever reason, five of which are lipophilic and two of which are hydrophilic. And we, we had no idea which drug to use and what dose to use. So we use this high throughput um, cell impedance assay, which we have in our lab. It's kind of in low use right now, if anybody's interested in, in trying it out. Uh, and anyway, the way this works is we take a 96 well cell culture plate, and we each each well in the bottom in the bottom has electrodes, positive and negative terminals, um, going across it, and it basically sends an electric current from the negative terminal to the positive terminal. So you add cells to this to these wells, and as they adhere and expand on the bottom of the well it impedes the electrical current, and that can be detected by the you know, linked up computer as cell growth. And when you add your immune cells or add your drugs and the cells die and lift off, then it, it is detected as cell death or a drop in the cell, um, the cell index. And so you can just basically load your cells one, on a Thursday and on Friday, you add your immune cells and your drugs and you go home for the weekend, you come back on Monday and you have 96 amazing data points <laughs> where the machine checks every 15 minutes or as often as you want it to. And you just have this tremendous amount of data in a short amount of time. So this is what we did. So we took um, mirroring tumor cell lines. We made it, we put it in a mouse and made a tumor. Then we took out the tumor from the mouse and harvested it and minced it into fragments to culture out the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes with IL-2 for up to two weeks. And then uh, at the same time, when the, when the till were just about ready, and, and high in number, we added that same murine tumor cell line back to one of these special plates. We let it adhere for 24 hours. And then the next day we added our um, CD8 positive till and uh, statin drugs at different concentrations. And then we left for the weekend. Um, and then this, and then most of this was actually done by um, Andre Burnham, the um, student in the, in the center here um, in between classes. <laughs> so just show you how, how cool this, this platform is. And, um, so we did this with a couple of different um, mouse models. I'm just showing you our mouse oral cancer one or Mach one model with simvastatin and lovastatin. So you can see that the normalized cell index, we normalize all of them at 24 hours when we add the drugs um, and, the, and the T cells. You know, it, and after a while, the growth in the black line at the top sort of tapers off as it runs out of space and nutrients. And then with the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, which is the top like inverted gray triangle, we saw some inhibition of growth. And then as we added stems, which are the white open uh, symbols, you can see there was a dose dependent drop in the cell index. But when we added um, till and statins together, there seemed to be some additive effect. And this was particularly the case for simvastatin and lovastatin. We had other statins that were able to kill cells better, uh, flustatin and, and pitavastatin, but they actually didn't really help the T cells kill. Um, Dr. Boyce, do you have a question? Yeah. Sorry. Please, um, yeah. How, how do you control for the expansion of the till effect? Good question. So, Doctor, the, the question for Doctor Boys is, um, how do you how do you how do you account for the fact of the the T cells changing the appearance? And that's a good question. I would say the generic answer is they don't because they're supposed to sort of float and attach without actually they don't adhere to the bottom of the plate and expand upon. But in it, I do, I do have to say the caveat from personal experience, sometimes when we see the till attaching, the, the index goes up, there's a blip before they die. So we actually see a little bit of a spike and then they go down because even though the T cells are not adhering to the bottom of the plate and expanding and spreading out like the, like the tumor cells, 
they actually do add more impedance of the current while they're killing, and then they and then everything lifts off and it goes down. So so you know you can kind of take that into account, but that's absolutely why we have to do T cells by themselves, and we have to have all these different control groups. But that's a very good question. It's a very valid question because we know like the immune cells actually do for a period of time make contact with the T cells, although we think it's momentary. So anyway, so this this seemed pretty cool, and and we basically started with seven and then there were two and then we had you know some dose ranges that seemed reasonable and, and how do we choose our doses to test we looked at the literature and we we found the peak serum concentrations that happens in a human after they take an oral dose of these drugs and that's how we ended up there um so then we wondered okay you know going back for a second this is not like an earth-shattering synergistic effect i think you can agree when you look at the graphs there's not it's not dramatically different when we use combination of till and statins. We're like, is it just killing more cells? Are the, are the T cells doing their thing and the statins are doing their thing? Or is there some sort of, um, you know, direct effect on the T cells? So, um, you know, some of my immunology colleagues here in the audience gave me the idea to do this experiment, which I think we really helped our, our paper was to take the T cells and before we add them to the plate, we're going to treat them for 24 hours with statins and then add them without statins. And now we actually saw our best effect yet where, you know, pre-treated till with lovastatin and simvastatin actually had the best effect over um, tumor cells treated with those alone. And so we think there is some direct effect on the, on the T cells. So then, you know, the next question, obviously, what happens in vivo? What happens when you put this in a mouse? So we took that same, those same mouse models I showed you um, sort of ex vivo and now we're doing it in vivo. We re, um, wait for the mouse tumor to get to a certain size at 10 to 14 days. And then we start giving them anti-PD-1 by IP injection. And then we gave statins similar to how we give them in humans. And this is really important. We gave them a dose um, by oral gavage every day, super fun, even on the weekends. And, <laughs> and then basically um, we chose a dose that lowers the serum cholesterol by about 40%, which in mice is very different. The, the doses you have to use are much higher than you would use in humans, but they're, they're very well tolerated. So we did this. And uh, what we found was, you know, here I'm showing you the graphs of individual animals and the controls, tumor growth is in gray, anti-PD-1 is in red and lovastatin in green. And you don't see any mice cured and you don't see much of a delay. It may be a very minor effect with anti-PD-1 by itself. But with combination, we saw something interesting. Um, about half the tumors were delayed growth and three out of 10 actually were cured, which doesn't sound like much, but this is a relatively aggressive model that I have never seen anything cure this model without some sort of local therapy. In other words, radiation or surgery or intratumoral uh, inter injection of a drug. Just giving two systemic drugs has never done this. And then just to see if this was really dependent on CD8 T cells, we depleted them and we abrogated that effect. And I think you can see on the survival too that we, we do see an improvement when we use these two things in combination. Um, and we also did flow cytometry from the tumors and the lymph nodes and the spleens during the second week of treatment on a subset of animals. And we found that T cells in the lymph node were more activated by increased production of interferon gamma and increased expression of CD107. But these are sort of generic, non-specific markers of T cell activation. What is driving this? What is the underlying mechanism? We didn't know. And this is where a light bulb comes on. And a student um, named Aaron Rosado came to spend some time in my lab um, and I started telling him about the different projects we were working on and, and a light bulb went on for Aaron um, because he had uh, studied T cell receptor um, biomechanics during his PhD at Georgia Tech with Chen Zhu. And um, he had read some papers recently suggesting cholesterol is an, really important for uh, T cell receptor mechanosensing. And um, there's a paper uh, that in immunity that showed that cholesterol is actually a component of the T cell receptor and involved in allosteric switching of the TCR from a resting state to an active state where it, wherein it can actually do downstream signaling and activation of the, of the T cell. Um, so we had this hypothesis that, that this could be important. Um, and then we started looking at the literature to see if there's other evidence that this could be the case. And we found evidence that, you know, T cells do accumulate cholesterol when they traffic to the TME and become dysfunctional. And um, we found a, a, an article suggesting that LDL receptor, which, as I showed you earlier, is increased by statins, interacts directly with the TCR complex to enhance signaling. Um, so at the time, um, the Zhu lab had just done uh, a nice study that they're, they're trying to publish right now, showing that T cells in the tumor microenvironment, and they, they defined that as the tumor 
and the tumor draining lymph node were dysfunctional compared to um, T cells, the same T cell for the same antigen anywhere else. Other lymph nodes in the spleen and, and this dysfunction they, was by TCR signaling. And they wondered, we wondered if cholesterol could be the cause and whether statins could rescue that function. Um, so here I'm showing you one of the assays that they did. Um, here they take a, a, a do a micro pipette 2D affinity assay where they take a T cell specific for a known antigen. In this case, it's ovalbumin on chicken protein, which is used as a model antigen. And they take a red blood cell from a human and they coat that red blood cell with um, ovalbumin or some fecal um, loaded on an MHC class one molecule. And so these things should interact. And the red blood cells is specifically chosen because it has a tensile force that can actually be measured by the micro pipette. And I'm probably butchering this description right now as I'm not an engineer, but um, that's my level of understanding. And so what they did was they looked at how, um, how frequently and how well these two uh, cells come into contact repeatedly. And if you look at those, those cells from, um, you know, basically an OT1 mouse that has nothing but um, uh, ovarium and specific T cells from the spleen versus the non-tumor draining lymph node versus the tumor draining lymph node, the two dimensional affinity of that TCR for its antigen was lower in the TDLN. But when we pretreated the mouse with statins in the exact same way we did in our um, in vivo study where we gave them oral gavage just for four days, completely abrogated that difference. And so th we did this first, this is from a, a B16 mouse melanoma model and we're doing this right now in our Mach 1 head and neck cancer model and it seems to be a consistent finding, which is which is pretty cool. So we think that, that might, this might be a, a major component of, of how statins are actually driving an enhanced immune response. Um, so that's kind of what we've done to date. I'm going to show you what we're doing next, which is kind of jump back around to, to the hearing and immunity and back. And so for on the hearing front, what's next for us is a uh, randomized placebo-controlled trial of atorvastatin to see if we can pre prevent cisplatin-induced hearing loss in our head and neck cancer patients treated with chemo radiation. Um, part of the reason I came to Emory is to do studies like this. Uh, I mean, this is something we could never power um, at NIH. Uh, we needed to be at a big, high-volume center. And so uh, we just got a UO one grant for this study after uh, years of trying. <laughs> and um, we at uh, Emory Winship will be the lead clinical site. Um, Nabil Saba is going to be my co-PI. NIDCD is going to be the, the coordinating site and the monitoring site and also a clinical site for patients in the um, DMV metro area. The University of Maryland and the University of Rochester are also going to participate in this. So we hope to accrue 186 patients uh, randomized between placebo and atorvastatin over uh, three and a half years. And hopefully um, we can definitively show that it makes a difference. And again, this is team science. These are um, um, just a, a selection of the people that have been helping with this at Emory and, and beyond. Um, remember those ethical questions I showed you at the beginning. Um, you know, number one, is it ethical to randomize patients to placebo or no statin when half of our patients ought to be on them? How do we get around this? Um, it's really important to have cardiology follow up to that. And Anant Mandawat, our cardio oncologist here at Winship is gonna be helping with this. In other words, at the end, since you know we as um, head and neck oncology providers are not good at getting people to the cardiologist beforehand, we're going to at least do the courtesy of getting them cardiologists afterward and decide on a case by case basis for every patient whether they have an indication to stay on statins or be on a different statin or whether they can come off at the end of the study. And then again, the statin therapy um, negatively impacts survival. That's something I think the literature would suggest the opposite. Um, and we're going to include that as a secondary outcome in our hearing loss study. And again, I don't, I don't, we're, we're powered for a non-inferiority um, endpoint for survival, and I don't think we'll, we'll see a significant difference. So what's next on the, the T cell front? Uh, Dr. Drew and I have, have, have just established a, a, a fruitful collaboration where then we're exploring the effects of statins on TCR signaling in mouse models of head cancer and melanoma. We're looking at 2D affinity, like I showed you, and also there's, I mean, he has an assay of, we can actually measure the force a T cell receptor bond and calcium flux as readouts uh, for TCR health and signaling. And ultimately, we want to validate these findings in a human study. So what does that human study look like? Uh, Nabil Saba and uh, my other colleagues here have uh, helped me design a study wherein we would take patients who are coming in for first-line recurrent metastatic um, immunotherapy treatment, um, and we would give them a standard pembrolizumab, but we would add Lovastatin at 80, uh, 80 milligrams. Why Lovastatin? Because that was our champion drug in our mouse study. And um, this is expected to lower the cholesterol by about 40%, like we, like we did in mice. 
Um, and, you know, there's there's one study that I didn't show you that's in um, lung cancer and mesothelioma where they uh, only found that the high um, high intensity statins were uh, protective in, in, in helping um, an immune response. And so that study suggests that the, the degree of lipid lowering actually matters. So we're going to go with a relatively high dose, but we have a built-in um, dose de-escalation if needed. And hopefully we will continue this for up to a year. Um, we are just getting ready to resubmit an R1 grant that would include this clinical trial along with some of the TCR signaling um, studies and um, some immune correlatives from the trial. Um, so a lot of you guys know this guy, Talfika Watakoko, who, who, who left us um, to go to Pittsburgh. And this is a kind of end with a fun story that just shows how small the world is. So I, I was talking to my mentor, Bob Barris, who's the director of the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute about some of the stuff we're doing. And I, I mentioned that we had a U01 grant. And he said, well, what's the U01 grant? And I said, it's really to see if a torvastatin can prevent cisplatin-induced hearing loss. He said, we're doing that too. I said, what do you mean you're doing that too? I just I just discovered it. I just published it. He goes, yeah, you know, Talfiq, you know, he used to be at Emory. Apparently he read a paper. <laughs> and I said, that's my paper. <laughs> and uh, so I was like, well, you know, I don't want us to do the same thing. You know, does he know that I'm doing a trial? I don't know. Let's. So I reconnected with Talfiq. You know, now he's at Pittsburgh. He's the chair there of, of Pimonk. And we had, a, we had a lovely meeting. And what he is doing is using um, this the UPCI network, which has a lot of satellite sites, similar to Emory, but, you know, further reaching. And he said, yeah, this is, we thought it was a great trial to run at our community sites. And so patients getting cisplatin for any cancer are going to be offered enrollment on their study where they're going to give them same dose of atorvastatin, 40 milligrams. And um, and they're just going to do audiograms on these patients in the community. And um, and it, so it's great because it's not exactly the same thing we're doing. But, you know, he did say that, you know, we can add Pittsburgh as another site if we need to for our study. And it's just a, um, a great, you know, collaborative and complementary um, way to go. And one thing that Tafik said, which I thought was really great, was that our our goal, you know, we're not we're not trying to get FDA approval of another indication for a torvastatin. That's it's not worth the investment. And often drug repurposing things are are used. Um, I don't want to say off label, but used based on good level one evidence. And ultimately, they get added to the NCCN guidelines for cancer treatment. So uh, Tafik said our goal is to incorporate statin therapy into NCCN guidelines versus platinum treated patients. Um, so I hope that's where this will go, uh, and I hope it will be for prevention of a lot of uh, survivorship issues as well as enhanced uh, survival. Um, but the other thing we could just do is add it to the water, and you know people have been saying that for years. So we don't need we don't need vitamin water; we need statin. So anyway, that is um, all I had for today. Uh, I would like to thank again Team Science, uh, numerous people, um, some of which are in the room and have given me really great ideas for this stuff over the years our funding for NIDCD for the last several years. And I, I did want to put in a, a plug and a pitch and a thank you for the Morningside Center for Innovative and Affordable Medicine, who gave us a pilot grant that funded all of these preclinical studies that I showed you to date and really gave us the pilot data we needed to apply for um, for more funding to hopefully do another clinical trial uh, with a different a different endpoint. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I'd be delighted to, to take any questions. Wait, can I just interject real quick, Crystal? I have to, I, I will be fired if I don't read this. So uh, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Schmidt. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I wanted to mention that next week we have Dr. Tammy Quest from Emory presenting the recommendation of best supportive care. What is it and how does it improve outcomes? To view all upcoming upcoming Winship Grand Round lecture, lectures, please visit the Grand Rounds page on the Winship Cancer Center website or the Winship calendar. All right, and uh, Crystal, please go ahead. <laughs> please. I was wondering why the SimVac statin was not effective in the um, change in hearing loss, but out of statin was. And just layering on that question, you said 50% of the patients with hearing loss, 50% don't. And I'm wondering if there's some sort of Phenomenon and yeah. Absolutely. So Dr. Paulus is asking hard questions I don't have the answer to. So, <laughs> just, you know, um, so the first question she asked was, um, why is such a striking difference um, in a simvastatin um, offering no hearing protection and a torvastatin so striking? Um, and the answer is we, we have no idea. We have absolutely no clue. We, it's, they're, they're both um, lipophilic statins. 
you know, they both, uh, you know, if, if you look at different doses, they both lower the cholesterol by a similar amount. So I really, we really don't understand that. And and because we don't really fully understand what is causing the hearing to be protected and the neural protection, you know, we need to, I guess we, I guess we need to sort that out first before we know, so we can compare the different drugs. But, you know, again, the, hypo, the underlying hypothesis is that they induce a heat shock response. And so whether some versus others induce a better heat shock response, I'm not sure. And then um, the other, sorry, the second part was um, whether, oh, why do 50% of patients get some hearing loss and why do others not? Um, and it's a little more complicated because some patients too also don't, don't actually get hearing loss, but they get tinnitus, which is super annoying. The ears ringing all the time in the absence of actually detectable hearing loss, but we know there, there are lots of the inner ear uh, impacted. And my colleague, Lisa Cunningham, has shown that cisplatin actually accumulates in the inner ear. So the more you give, the more it just lingers in the inner ear forever. We've done like cadaver studies and she's, you can see the cisplatin still in the inner ear um, forever. And so um, so that we think is, is part of it, but there are probably some underlying genetic susceptibilities um, but but nobody's ever done it, and, and people have attempted to do genetic susceptibility studies and, and different things, but nobody's ever landed on a gene or genes that can explain it. Yeah. Yeah. So, Dr. Paul, the next question is: How do we know that it's truly related to TCR signaling? How do we know it's not just differences in, in T cell differentiation or, or activation? And and that's actually it's a great lead into some of the things we want to do. And so, you know, in our um, grant we submitted, we included more mouse studies. We've actually switched from doing flank injections to orthotopic oral injections. So that's, we're, we're trying to more closely mimic the real immune microenvironment of head neck cancer. And then we also plan to do a lot more complex, you know, um, cytop studies to look at lots of different T cell markers. Cause there's gotta be more, you know, so far we've only had really kind of generic things like gamma production and CD107 and, and you know, but we don't, we, we need to dive a little deeper into not only the T cell compartment, but the macrophage compartment. Cause we also, one thing I didn't mention was there appears to be a skewing towards M1 macrophages versus M2. And that's, as you know, a very kind of uh, simplistic description of the myeloid compartment. So we, we, we have so much more to learn. I hear Dr. Waller's got a uh, question. Is there a connection between the anti-fibrotic effect of statins and their immunomodulatory modulatory effects? You know, I, I showed that study where Pravastatin was able to reverse um, radiation fibrosis, which um, again, when I saw that, it really blew my mind. A really good question. I don't think we know the answer to that, and uh, which you know, I'm, I bet they did skin biopsies or punch biopsies during that study. So it'd be very interesting to see. Do we see changes there? Um, and I don't, I don't. Again, I don't think uh, I don't think we know the mechanism. And but I'll I'll look and see if I can find any any data on that. Another question. Yeah, we want to. Yeah. <laughs> so the next question was um, an excellent question about uh, have we looked at that cholesterol metabolism within the T cell? We 100% we need to. Um, and I've been talking to Suman Kong here at Winship about some ways to to you know do some you know heavy duty metabolomics and different things to to look exactly at that. Um, Based on data in the literature, it does change. You know, even if you look at cholesterol esterification or, or um, you know, um, you know, knockdown of ACAT1 or other pathways uh, involving cholesterol metabolism, it does seem to impact it. You know, and and um, you know, in terms of the, you know, more in depth look at the at the TCR, even it's we think it is a lipid raft or the amount of cholesterol within the within the TCR that that impacts that. And so I think another. Another avenue we absolutely need to that we've untouched and and others are looking at it now. It's interesting. The paper just came out in Cancer Cell, I want to say about a month ago, where they basically showed that 
blocking cholesterol synthesis actually completely ruins the T cell response, which, is, which at first glance seems completely opposite to what we're showing. But they used very heavy handed tactics where they genetically knocked out cholesterol synthesis or used a uh, lobostatin at five micromolar, which is something that's you got to pour it on. You know, you, 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 it's it's not achievable in, a, in, a, in an organism um, serum. So um, when you do that and completely shut it down, as you might imagine, the T cells stop proliferating. They actually need cholesterol to proliferate. Every cell does. Right. So um, there's a sweet spot, I think, where. You know, you can enhance some of these T TCR signaling pathways and some of these activation pathways without actually tipping the cells over. And I showed you the results we saw with lovastatin in the mouse, and I, we did it with simvastatin too. It was a little bit less impressive, and I think it was because our simvastatin dose was too high. I think it, I think it um, was having a, a minor impact on T cell proliferation. So we got to find the sweet spot, Dr. Lisinski. <laughs> Yeah, so that's an interesting question. Uh, we haven't tried the priming part. I and mean, the question was how we looked at the, the timing and the, the sequencing of events where in this, you know, statins. Uh, to some degree, we have. So you, if we, we've done this in vivo where we, we started off by just treating the mouse for three or four days, you know, daily as we were doing in our in vivo experiments to see if we could line it up. But then we, you know, Chen decided to try an interesting thing where just just take the T cells over from the TDLN and the NDLN and the spleen, and then do ex vivo statin treatment. And the answer is, even if two or two to four hours, you can already see it abrogate that detriment from the TDLN. So that this T cells seem to recover very quickly within hours. The follow up question you asked about how long does that last? And we don't know. <laughs> Part of the problem is that the T cells, they're pretty fragile. Once we get them out, we're like scrambling, drive over to Georgia Tech and hand them off in a bag of ice. And and we haven't, you know, we 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 got to do all the experiments that same day, but we haven't actually seen like, you know, does that does that effect persist? And so I think I think that's a great experiment we could do. Wherein, what if we give statins for a week and then stop, and then and then what happens? Um, and we would probably have to do that in vivo just to make sure the T cells can survive the trip. So, Dr. Gless. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Great question. So Dr. Gillespie's question is, is this, uh, are these effects specific to statins or do other cholesterol manipulations actually do the same thing? And the answer seems to be yes. So, so a lot of this started out with, um, as I started getting interested in this, again, really just the way I told the talk like a story, because that's kind of how I fell into all of this, um, was just finding these, these papers. But before the satin question, um, the big thing was PCSK9 inhibitors. And so there have been some work, um, there was a Nature paper and then some collaborative work at NCI showing that PCSK9 inhibitors can actually enhance responses to anti-PD-1 immunotherapy. And PCSK9 are, are um, actually inhibiting that enzyme, and they're 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 a little bit more heavy-handed, and they're used for patients with statin refractory hyperlipidemia or patients with familial hyperlipidemia, really severe cases. And they're still on patent, and they're still very expensive. And there was some some benefit there. So I thought, well, why use PCSK9? Why not use statins? They're cheap. They're four bucks at Walmart. And so that was really my, you know, being being very, you know, cost conscious in medicine. Um, that was part of, of my impetus for doing statins instead. But so PCSK9 inhibitors are some uh, data and also inhibiting, like I said, the ACAT1, which is a, an enzyme that um, uh, that participates in cholesterol esterification. So you can, you can, the short answer is you can, at least for the immune stuff, you can manipulate cholesterol in a variety of ways. And, and a lot of it converges on the same 
effect in terms of enhancing the immune response again up until the point and then if you clobber it it'll it'll um harm the t-cell response as for the other stuff you know again what is the mechanism for the hearing protection or the radiation fibrosis reversal i haven't got a clue <laughs> and maybe one day we'll find it and um so i i you know appreciate Ned Waller's comment on you know how to you know maybe i'll start looking into that and see if there's a way to figure it out um, Dr. Lawson asking a question, since atorvastatin works and simvastatin doesn't, doesn't that suggest your results don't have anything to do with cholesterol? That, that may be true for, um, for hearing. Um, and I think, you know, I think for the immune stuff, pretty much, you know, any drug sort of works. But so, again, some statins work better than others. And I think, it's, I think a lot of it is the magnitude of, of um, lipid lowering and, and hitting that sweet spot. For the non-immune stuff, the hearing loss, and radio, again, we haven't got a clue. And I think that that's a good point. The fact that simvastatin does nothing, even though it does lower the this, this serum cholesterol, it does really suggest some sort of other neuroprotective effect. So yeah, if anybody has any ideas that we could look at to understand that better, please let me know. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, for a wonderful grand round. See you next week.